The Great Steppe, millenniums of events, hundreds of nomadic tribes and people. They lived, worked, made discoveries, conquered large tracts of lands, and left us some mysteries. To learn more about it, watch the project called Enigma of the Great Steppe. In the spring of 1776, a new officer came to one of the fortresses built by the Russian Empire near the Irtysh River. Everyone was waiting for his arrival. People did not know much about the captain except his name, age, origin, and marital status. Ivan Grigorievich Andreev, 32 years old, married, nobleman, but his family did not yet move to his new place of service. Unlike the other military people, Captain Andreev was not interested in the service of the guard or the condition of the weapon arsenal. He was always asking different questions, studying the surrounding area, examining the banks of the river, leaving somewhere and then coming back, measuring something, making notes and drawings. The records and conclusions of the Captain Engineer Andreev led to great changes in the fortress very soon and later prompted the establishment and development of one of the glorious cities on the Irtysh River. The so-called Seven Chambers are located on the eastern bank of the Irtysh River. Kalmyks called them Darhan Zorjin Kit and say that these constructions were built by the priest Darhan Zorjin. To you men, in the archive I found the letter of merit of Tsar Mikhail Fyodorovich dated October 25th, 1616. These constructions are mentioned as stone mosques. The city located on the banks of the Irtysh is known as Sibipalatinsk for almost three centuries, and now known as Simei. In history, it is written that the beginning of the establishment of the city began with the fortress, which was founded near some strange ruins in 1718 by the detachment led by the military commander, Vasily Cheridov. His expedition operated under the decree of Peter the Great, who believed that the lands of the nomads were a strategically important area. Pondering the progress to the east, the Russian Empire began the construction of the fortifications on the banks of the Irtysh River, in the early 18th century. The small fortress where the captain engineer Ivan Andreev was sent was just a part of this Irtysh line. Despite the most common version, the origin of the city remains very mysterious. Which seven chambers were built on the banks of the river? Who lived here when the emissaries of Peter the Great arrived? Why Semipalatinsk, now Semei, is not located on the place where the fortress of seven chambers were built? And what happened to the gate that Captain Andreev has designed? The matter is that this place has been known for a long time with its so-called Buddhist temple, which was eight miles far along the Irtysh. When the troops arrived, this temple had already been destroyed, and there were only seven chambers left, seven rooms. The detachment arrived and built the fortress here. And since this area was called Seven Chambers, so the fortress received the name Seven Chambers, Semipalatnaya. Hearing the phrase Stone Chambers, we imagine a disappeared city with huge palaces and big temples. Scientists and local people used to say different stories about the mysterious ruins. The Russian historian Tatishev considered them to be Scythian and associated with the name of the ancient Greek astronomer Ptolemy. Others claim that the chambers were built during the reign of Aksak Timir, Tamerlane. And in the middle of the 19th century, the Russian press reported a hypothesis that the ancient people, Chudes, stayed in wealthy and beautiful houses of these lands. The most widespread version is the one which states the seven chambers were the ruins of the Buddhist temple which was abandoned or destroyed because of the constant raids of the Jungar people. Today, there is no sign of the mysterious chambers, but we have a unique opportunity to see how they look like a century ago. We'll talk about this a bit later, and now we'll make a stop on the Irtysh River bank, not far from the Seven Chambers. Exactly here stayed the captain engineer, Ivan Andreev, who was sent to the fortress with a special mission. 
крепость располагалась вот здесь. The fortress was located right here on the river bank. There was a floodplain close to the river. It was constantly flooded. Some islands were here, and it was an uncomfortable place with mosquitoes and high humidity. Для здоровья здесь местность. Тут были комары. The fortress looked like a skewed rectangle. Because of the constant floods, the fortress was heavily deformed. This is one of the reasons. And the second reason, this place was not useful in military sense. When Commander Springer came, he noticed that the whole fortress was open and it was possible to see the movement of the detachments from the high hills. This fortress was also uncomfortable because of difficult to see the movement of ships from it. Because of high bush and floodplain, it was impossible to see when someone was sailing and also was hard to open fire from this fortress. These reasons led to the decision to move the fortress eight miles higher to the place where the city of Simipalatinsk is located now. Everybody called this place the old fortress. The fortification was moved closer to the Seven Chambers. The second version of the Seven Chambers fortress appeared to be more successful. Over time, the settlement became a big city. The fortress was built and it had thick walls, moats and the mound with bastions. There were three gates inside. The gates were different. The first ones, called Yamishev Gates, led to the Yamishev Fortress and Salt Lake. The second ones led to Uskomenegorsk, and they were called Uskomenegorsk Gates. And the third gates were called Irtish, or Semipalatinsk Gates. Only Yamishev Gates were preserved. They are unique and have been protected by the government since 1949. They are built in the Romanesque style. Look, the huge walls are two meters high. They are really impressive with vaulted ceilings. These huge wooden alignments are iron bound. Here we see huge metal braces. Here you see the most interesting is the peephole. They used to see through this peephole who came, who was knocking the gate. Look at these huge rings, chains hung here. The most interesting, here when the two doors were closed, a huge lock was put, and this lock was preserved. It is in the museum of local history. This lock weighs more than eight kilograms, and if we put it here, then we can really see the most authentic fortress gates of the 18th century. But the key to the lock was lost. Like the fortress, Yamashev gates and weapons are not at the place where they were initially installed by the captain engineer Andreev. Many years ago, when new roads were laid in the city, the monument was moved slightly aside and partially reconstructed. By the way, Simei City has many mysteries that excite the history lovers. For example, what did the Seven Chambers look like? Where did the Kazakh poet, educator Ibrahim Kunanbaev go and what did he read? And how did the picture, which is sometimes called the unknown portrait of Dostoevsky, appear in the local temple? Once the governor of Sibipalatinsk lived in this cozy building, the official receptions and magnificent balls were held in this building. They welcomed important guests and famous travelers. Now this house became the museum of local history. Its exhibits include the very image of the famous Seven Chambers. When the traveler Miller visited our region, there were seven partially destroyed stone chambers here. And he drew the image he saw and wrote a few words about them. He wrote about what kind of chambers they were, how did they look like. The building consisted of several isolated rooms that had no roofs. Some rooms were interconnected with each other. The traveler Miller left us a specific description of this building. 
This picture with the description was found in his bag. Next to the drawing of the seven chambers, there is an impressive lock of the Yamashev gates. Since the fortification was on the lowlands, the enemies could see movements from above. So the defenders had to lock the gates at night. Many people flocked to the fortress. Some escaped from the Jungar people, others were brought here as the convict to develop the region. The voluntary migrants, Cossacks and Tatars, arrived here. Former military men stayed and lived in this fortress. Then traders, merchants and entrepreneurs started to arrive in the fortress. And when there was no need in locking the gates of the settlement, and it was given the status of the city, the government gave the emblem and appointed the city governor. By this time, the keys to the lock were lost. During the Tsarist government, Semipalatinsk had 13 governors. One of them hosted the famous traveler, Przewalski. Ibrahim Kunanbaev participated in that meeting as it was reported in the newspaper, Semipalatinsk Regional Bulletin. The Kazakh poet educator Ibrahim Kunanbaev was a well-known respected person, an active member of the local statistical committee and, as they would say today, was a valuable person of the city. I was told about an elderly Kazakh Ibrahim Kunanbai, frequent visitor to the library who reads Mill, Buckle, Draper and other authors. The first meeting he surprised me asking to tell about induction and deduction. As it turned out, he was interested in English and Western European philosophers. The memorial tablet on the building of the local bank is not noticed immediately. In 1883, the city's book depository was opened here. This depository was often visited by the person who is now considered the founder of the Kazakh written literature and its first classicist. Ibrahim Kunanbaev was a regular reader of the Semipalatinsk public library. In the 1850s, being a child, Ibrahim Kunanbaev took lessons of Ahmed Riza of the local madrasa at the area, which was once called the Tatar Sloboda. His father brought him to study in Semipalatinsk, where the young student, Shakirt, learned Eastern literature, philosophy, and fell in love with poetry. Of course, a little step boy did not even know that he would become an outstanding person, the pride of the Kazakh steppe and the Semipalatinsk city. Amazingly, during the same years, another outstanding writer, Fyodor Mikhailovich Dostoevsky, went to military service and on civilian affairs through the houses of Semipalatinsk using the same roads. Recently, local ethnographers made a small discovery connected to Dostoevsky. This is the Resurrection Cathedral. Even though it is quite old, nobody ever thought that the church might relate to the name of Dostoevsky. The fact is that during the Semipalatinsk exile, Fyodor Mikhailovich visited a completely different church. Znaminsk Church. Unfortunately, in the 30s of the last century, it was destroyed, and the icons were either taken by believers or disappeared without a sign. In the 40s, some icons were returned to one of the churches, and it was the Resurrection Cathedral. Together with the icons, someone brought this picture of religious content. It is called Christ Blesses Soldier. At first, people just did not pay attention to this picture. And later, not so long ago, local history researchers and other curious people became interested in this picture, and they began to compare different pictures. And by comparing all the portraits of Fyodor Mikhailovich Dostoevsky, they made the conclusion that this is the portrait of Fyodor Mikhailovich Dostoevsky. The author's name is unknown, but maybe someone who is watching this program knows its author, or maybe have read somewhere, we will be happy if he or she shares this secret with us. Once Dostoevsky sent his brother following the description of the Semipalatinsk city. It is the border of the Kyrgyz steppe. The city is quite large and crowded. Most of citizens are Asian people. Someday I'll write you more about Semipalatinsk. It's worth it. 
Perhaps the writer wanted to tell about the mysterious Seven Chambers. Very few people know about this, and they say he was interested in the ruins of one of the rooms and even found something there. Мы знаем точно об одной палате. То есть это каменное такое здание. И вот We know about one chamber. It is a stone building. By the time Fyodor Mikhailovich Dostoevsky arrived in Semipalatinsk, this building had already been destroyed. И только валялись разные артефакты. Only different artifacts were lying around. People used to find them sometimes. And Dostoevsky, due to his curiosity and education, started to search and view these artifacts. Thus, people say that he found a dagger of the Jungarian soldiers, and he gave this dagger to Chokhan Valikhanov before Chokhan left for the long journey. Dostoevsky left the orderly, the casket, and there were various things that Dostoevsky found while being at one of the chambers. This casket, with the findings, he left the orderly. Through the memories of the orderly and Gibovich, we know that the dagger was found during these excavations and was given to Chokhan Valikhanov. It turns out that Fyodor Mikhailovich can be considered the amateur archaeologist to some extent. There is even a photo on which Chokhan Valikhanov holds the very Jungarian dagger. In addition, the writer and the officer Valikhanov were friends. Most probably, Dostoevsky made Chokhan a gift on the eve or after the famous and dangerous journey of Chokhan to Kashgar. Why did the Kazakh aristocrat pretend to be an ordinary man who led a caravan? And how did the topographers thank one of the Semipalatin's merchants nicknamed Bull? Semipalatinsk merchant Bukash, who volunteered to send the caravan at his own expense to the Central Asian possessions, was given the rank of the cornet and golden medal of the Vladimir ribbon. In the mid-19th century, the Russian and British empires were interested in the situation and the alignment of forces in Central Asia and Western China. According to some assumptions, during the visit to Semipalatinsk, Chokhan decided to penetrate the closed Chinese province of Kashgar. And it was better to enter in the caravans. It is worth noting that at that time, Semipalatinsk region already had a favorable geographical position. The city was located on the trade routes to Russia, Western Siberia, China, and Mongolia. So Valikhanov only had to find the person who could be trusted with the details of the secret intelligence expedition. And in his records, we found the person nicknamed Bull. Mir Kurban Ayupov was also called Bukash. Bukash is his nickname, this means Bull. He was very persistent and tenacious. Therefore, in many records, he is mentioned as Bukhash. Mir Kurban Ayupov is his official name. He was famous not because he was a good merchant in Simsk, but because he helped Chokhan Valikhanov on the secret expedition to Kashkaria. Namely, he equipped a caravan, a small one with 101 camels and 65 horses and sent this caravan to Kashgaria. So he made his contribution to this story. Last year, our society, Priyartishia, made a trip to this wintering place. And the most curious thing is that how we found this wintering. To understand this, it is necessary to know something about this person. He was very active, energetic, and had many friends and knew many things. Once, cartographers were passing by this wintering. And they made him a very original gift to thank him for his hospitality. They figured out his coordinates. We entered the coordinates in the GPS navigator and we found exactly his wintering place. This is a very unique case and everyone can be amazed. The citizens always liked to follow merchants. Their nature and actions were entertaining, offended, inspired and sometimes shocked the local society. 
For example, the name of one of the entrepreneurs was associated with one love story. What was left in Semei in memory of love of this couple? How were the works of the greatest painters of the 18th and 19th centuries found in this provincial city? And where to look for the sign of the Alash city? This photo shows one of the largest houses known in pre-revolutionary Semipalatinsk. His owner was the local oligarch, Fyodor Stepanov. Today, the building looks a little different. One of the well-known museums in Kazakhstan and outside of it, now located in this building. Fyodor Stepanov was a completely unique person with a very interesting biography. Let's start with his birth. As many sources show, he was an illegitimate son of the famous Semipalatinsk merchant Popov. Popov. He fell in love with a Kazakh girl and she was his second wife. The son was born. Popov left a will where he bequeathed the half of the estate to his second family. Fyodor Stepanov was a very smart person. He did not just multiply his estate, but became a very rich man. If I'm not mistaken, he had 19 gold mines, all sorts of graphite plants. He was the merchant and a very wealthy man. Dostoevsky wrote about him, about the merchant Stepanov. Dostoevsky was personally acquainted with him. While visiting the prosecutor of Semipalatinsk, Baron Wrangel, Dostoevsky stayed at the house of the merchant Stepanov, but not at this one at another, and he communicated with Fyodor Stepanov there. This is a very interesting story. Dostoevsky wrote that Stepanov was a young, enterprising, interesting man and his mother was a great cook. In the mid-80s of the last century, Nevzorov's family, family of hereditary collectors, decided to donate works of art to one of the cities. They liked the Museum of Semipalatinsk and gave the works to this museum. This is how a rich collection of paintings and art objects appeared in the Kazakh city, far from European capitals. Now the most unexpected stories can be heard in the former house of the merchant Stepanov. This is the hall which represents the Russian art of the 19th century, works of such artists as Venetsianov, Tropinin, Bogolubov. Most of these wonderful works are the gift of Nevzarov's family, except the work of Bogolubov, which were brought from a private collection in Moscow when our museum was being established. Another interesting thing of this room is that there is something that has been preserved from the Soviet period of the early 30s. It is a huge chandelier, which we did not change. According to some stories, a notorious person, Nikolai Yezhov, sat in this room. He was a chairman of the Gubernia Committee of Semipalatins during four years. This is a historical fact. You see, because the power of art is great, we do not feel that this person was working here. Here we can admire wonderful things. Here is one more story. At the beginning of the 20th century, the city became the political center of the Alash movement. The reformers proclaimed it the capital of a new autonomy. But was it about the whole Semipalatinsk city? This is the plan of the city of Alash, approved in November 1916. Again, we cannot say that the whole city was called Alash City. According to this city plan, the main part of Alash City was located in Janasimysk, part of the city. Here we can see some remarks. So if to look in details, we can find at least an approximate location of the city of Alash. I think this matter is to be solved in the future. So we came back to the place where everything started. Who knows, perhaps the captain engineer Ivan Andreev guessed how would Semipalatnia, seven chambers, fortress, change? What interesting and saturated life would be in it?
In any case, all his future life was connected to this region. He studied the customs and language of the Kazakhs, compiled one of the first Russian Kazakh dictionaries, wrote an interesting ethnographic work on this amazing land and its people.